Well, welcome everybody and, 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 a, and a great welcome to our regulars from our symposium over the last uh, few years and welcome to those people new to us today for this special symposium. For those who are new, I'm Geoffrey Guy, the founder and chairman of the Guy Foundation. And our foundation was set up to consider quantum effects in biology uh, with its relevance to health and disease and with the opportunity to think about therapeutics and interventions in, in, the, in the future. So I thought um, what I'd do is, is, is give a little bit of context as to how this, 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 this meeting came about. And over the last two decades, uh, myself, Alistair and Jimmy, both on the call, call today, we've been considering the um, interaction of cellular bioenergetics with uh, biological processes, uh, namely inflammation and metabolic processes in the early days. And we focused a lot of our thought on metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a cardio-inflammatory metabolic syndrome, sometimes attended by abnormal uh, coagulopathy as well, very much related to modern day human lifestyle. And uh, in our early papers, we described uh, metabolic syndrome, which many of you will recognize in, in, in Western society as type two diabetes and the attendant obesity that, that goes with it. But we, uh, we described it more as accelerated aging and focus very much on the role of mitochondria. I think in the first decade of thinking about this, it's fair to say that we share the same view as probably most scientists around the world, that most medicine and biology was to do with chemistry and almost entirely chemistry alone. The interaction of molecules with one another and ligands with, with, re with receptors. But we've moved our focus onto uh, mitochondria as a modulator of homeostasis, both in terms of energy, energy trend, transduction and in, me, in messaging, and began to think about thermodynamics, the mitochondria working and modulating um, through thermodynamics. And we were thinking in the sort of a Newtonian or a conventional sense of thermodynamics. And I think it was Alistair's early work uh, with uh, Stan at the laser laboratories at Harwell, where we started looking at two photon microscopy bombarding target molecules with photons that we began to understand that we were changing the target quite markedly. And that drew our thinking towards you know, quantum effects. And that probably started about eight years ago, I, I suppose. So from being a biological object, the mitochondria started in our mind to look more like a, a physics and mathematics construct. Uh, uh, and that fitted in very well with some of the uh, thinking about quantum effects in biology. Now, many of you will know about these quantum effects. We've talk about them endlessly in our symposia over the last uh, four or five years now. Um, there's, uh, there's entanglement, there's superpositioning, super radiance, um, a coherence, for example, but more prominent in our thinking over the last couple of years, especially after last year's symposiums was the role of spin, of electron spin and other particle spin. And spin very much determined by magnetic fields in the way that um, weight is determined by gravity from uh, weight upon mass is, is determining, or the weight derived from mass is determined by gravity, spin is determined by magnetic fields. We also began to understand that perhaps by altering spin, I say electron spin in a molecule, you one might alter the way in which that molecule interacts with its environment and with other molecules. And it um, occurred to us, therefore, that life and of course humans had evolved in essentially a Goldilocks zone of gravitational, photonic and magnetic environment over the last uh, millions or billion, billions of years and that we are very comfortable in that Goldilocks zone and that drew our attention to thinking about well what happens if one goes outside that zone and it isn't a giant leap for mankind and certainly not a giant leap for science to think about well, what's happening in near earth orbit or in open space. And so these magnetic fields, these gravitational fields are altered and diminished in near earth orbits and in open space, probably the magnetic fields perhaps non-existent and on other planets, for example, Mars. So that's what's led us to, our, to thinking about these matters. Uh, what can we learn from what might be adaptive changes, they may be pathological changes or super aging changes that we might see with space travelers. What can we learn about uh, uh, terrestrial health or the other way around, what measures or considerations must one take 
to, engar uh, to safeguard the welfare of, of, of space travelers. So I'd like to welcome our, our speakers today. I will be introducing them one at a time as we, as, as we go into our session. Just to remind you all that, um, that these sessions, uh, the presentations are recorded, the Q&A is recorded, but will not be uh, 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 repeated or, or reproduced on our website. So our presentations you will find on the website and on our um, a YouTube channel. And there will be a, um, a proceedings document prepared by, by Bethany, uh, which will follow uh, after, after this, um, this symposium today. So I think um, we're going to have a short break at about 10 to 5 British time. So that's in just about an hour and three quarters time, a short comfort break before we go into the final part of the session. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alistair Nunn. Alistair is Director of Science for the Guy Foundation, and he's visiting professor at the Research Centre for Optimal Health at the University of Westminster. Alistair, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Geoffrey, as Geoffrey uh, has introduced me. Um, I've slightly taken a slightly different spin on this and thinking um, I made the point are mitochondria trapping us on Earth. Um, and I'm going to briefly talk about the role of stress, optimal health and the non-chemical field homeostasis, which we hope brings it all together. Um, key points for this meeting. Um, how similar is the dishomeostasis induced by uh, being in space, similar to that induced by a poor lifestyle? And does it result in a, a potentially a similar aging phenotype, accelerated aging cheap aging phenotype? Um, what are the likely mechanisms and do they involve non-chemical factors more explainable by non-chemical homeostasis involving fields and possibly quantum effects? And can we assign a hierarchy? And I think it's what NASA has obviously been doing this for a long time uh, in relation to factors that cause or don't cause cellular stress. Um, this obviously has some impact on the differing between, say, travel in space when there's no gravity to say arriving at Mars where there is some gravity, but no magnetic or very few, or very mild magnetic fields. And can we focus on a cellular system where there's a lot of interest and there's certainly a lot of data that might act like the canary in the metabolic coal mine, uh, such as the mitochondrial function, such as mitochondria? And there's actually, I've, I've come across an evolving idea, you know, are these changes pathological or adaptive? And I'll, I'll touch on the concept of tensor gradient. I can't really pronounce it properly. I'm sorry, I've just come across it. Um, Basically, we evolved in this nice blue marble here. And like, you know, like humans all through history, we want to go somewhere else. And it's taken us a long time, four billion years and certainly the last hundred million to become human. And certainly the last 80 years, we managed to get into space. And what we've realized is a great deal of problems, there's a lot of problems with health. Um, as Jeffrey pointed out, of course, can we, is there a two way thing here, two way sort of interface? And certainly to go to the moon, it's we're talking about weeks, but to Mars, we're talking about months to years. Asteroids, we're into the, we're into long years, and of course, if we go any further, we're talking, you know, maybe centuries to millennia. That's a long way off. So really, we might be able to boil this down to a, to, to a simple uh, problem. Um, for the, one of the problems about man going into space is not just technical in producing the latest warp drive or rocket, but it's actually about understanding our uh, our aging and health, and we're not actually that far down the road with it. We still have really haven't cracked it on Earth. And those of you interested, that's Hermes from the Martian. Um, and one of the things we've always been interested in is this, and this is actually looking at what we spend on healthcare. And some estimates are saying that, for instance, uh, lifestyle induced disease could be costing the Americans so, uh, north of 800 billion uh, per year. And then you look at that and compare it to, say, NASA's budget or ITA, or but the budget of ITA, the fusion reactor system uh, experiments, then it's tiny. So we do have a problem. And we've kind of thought about this and we've always been interested in space. Well, I certainly have. And we've used this idea and um, some may, you know, may not have seen this, but we've suggested that one of the reasons, one of the explanations of Fermi's paradox, and I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but Enrico Fermi was sort of purported to have said in the 50s uh, to one of his friends that, well, if aliens are everywhere, where are they? And we basically said, well, could it be that because it takes a long time to evolve under stress, um, intelligence always tries to outwit its environment and it gets to the point with technology where it removes all the stress in the environment and therefore stops evolving. So could healthcare costs stop, um, you know, it's so prohibitive that aliens can't afford to go and as Jimmy pointed out, you know, ET should phone the local gym. And, of course, and this is a, this was around the same time as I was putting this paper together. I actually contacted Seth Shostak at, at SETI and asked for a quote. And he said, heck, we spend more on cat food than we do space research, which I kind of said, you know, sums it all up, really. Um, so what is health? Are we simply talking about a lack of disease? Is it a failure of homeostasis? Can we measure it? Is it about metabolic flexibility and reserve? Can it be stimulated? And do we need drugs? And certainly, 
we know that humans, like many species, do have a limited lifespan, but within that lifespan, we can certainly modulate it by various environmental factors, um, some of it's genetic, but a lot of it is environment. Oops. So what are one of the drivers? And now this is uh, this concept of hormesis. And we've been looking at the role of uh, adaptive thermodynamics. And one of the sort of uh, descriptions of life is it's a self-organizing and self-replicating far from equilibrium sort of dispersive structure. And as Erwin Schrodinger said, it's an area of negatory. And actually, it kind of encompasses the concept of hormesis, whereby a small amount of stress induces an adaptation. Too much stress obviously is bad for you. And over, certainly for a very long time, um, certainly since the 40s and 50s, this perhaps has been misinterpreted because uh, nobody actually thought that below a certain amount of, say, radiation or indeed certain concentration of drugs, anything happened. But of course, this is far from the truth because we would never have evolved without this kind of that adaptation. And we've kind of put together this, these ideas. And this just basically shows what taken from lots of different papers about what could be our optimum health uh, expectancy if we lived a really healthy lifestyle. And it suggests that, you know, it could be between 90 to 100. And the key here is the healthy life expectancy. And this suggests that if we lived a healthy lifestyle, we could live, you know, for most of our life in good health. And it all goes wrong at the end when we shuffle off the mortal coil. But what we actually see uh, is, that, you know, average life expectancy is near 80. And with a slightly bigger, what we call morbidity expansion, i.e. we spend more time in ill health. And if you go into the obesity and type 2 diabetes areas, you start to see a great reduction in life expectancy and, and a much bigger uh, propensity of your life in, in, in illness. And certainly we suspect that COVID-19 has exemplified this because one of the things that may be controlling this is metabolic flexibility, which in turn is related to mitochondrial function. And certainly there's some data now in America suggesting that less than 7% of Americans, and I apologise for this, may actually exist in optimal cardiovascular health. Um, this is the slide that Jimmy always shows, and I love it. It's an escalator going to a fit, going to a gym. So can we look at the uh, mitochondrial idea of the mitochondrial area? Now, one of the things about mitochondria is everybody thought for a long time they were just this small organelle that just produced energy, but actually central to everything in the cell. And certainly if you change the nucleus, you change uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, membrane change, all these related to function of the mitochondria. And one of the things which is interesting here, of course, is that a lot of this is revolves around the flow of electrons and, of course, redox. And what we know, what we now know, of course, this is all related to cytoskeleton changes, which I'll talk about later. But certainly radiation, gravity, magnetic fields, circadian rhythms, pressure of oxygen and lots of other things interfere, modulate this. Which, of course, raises another rather quite interesting question. Are we are mitochondria trapping us, trapping us on Earth? And we know that prokaryotes are much more able to survive uh, you know, hard space. And, but multicellular life maybe slight, might find it slightly more difficult. So can we adapt our, uh, our mitochondria, which are, of course, distant cousins of, uh, of prokaryotes, to, to, to help us survive? And this is what Jeffrey was talking about. About eight or nine years ago, we came to realise that, of course, and that people have realised for a very long time, that it's quite likely that certain components in, in, in say, for instance, the mitochondria are relying on quantum effects, for instance, tunnelling for electrons, protons, and even bigger ions. And certainly spin is something which also might be important. So we need to think about the quantum mitochondrion. And when we start thinking like that, we also have to start to think about uh, the work, for instance, of Mike Levine and bioelectric fields and the morphogenetic, uh, morphogenetic um, fields. And of course, if we think about the early Earth, there were obviously electric you know, the magnetic fields, but in origins of life itself, there was a huge movement of ions, because when ions move, it creates electric fields. So charge is moving. And so actually, you could begin to think about the possibility that actually electric fields were important right at the beginnings of life. And of course, they're important today. In short, you know, we've all been brought up with the chemicals on this side, but actually fields may be just as important. Which, of course, brings us to the quantum mitochondrial canary. So we start to think about, well, will these quantum effects be important detecting changes in the environment and indeed the ability to adapt? So in summary, really, we, we evolved over here, which was in, a, in this area, you know, early Earth, where we had fairly consistent gravity. Uh, the magnetic fields probably changed. Circadian rhythm was fairly constant. Pressure and oxygen obviously changed. And radiation obviously changed. And so life got canalized, as it's called, over here. And it's now been fine-tuned with these variable factors, which seem to stimulate its enhanced adaptability, which are range from movement, sleep, temperature. Even sleep can be hormetic, photons, oxygen, and radiation. But of course, when we go into space, everything shifts around. Clearly, we have a lot more radiation on the wrong side of the hormetic curve. Gravity is obviously right down here somewhere. And of course, then magnetic fields and other things may also vary. And 
and certainly from what Ashton's been saying and from his previous lectures, mitochondria are struggling here. We see changes in the electron potential change in the electron transport chain and increased, uh, for instance, reactive oxygen species. So, of course, it suggests that all humans have a flight on bloat. I'm a pilot and I have to know this backwards. But of course, we exist in this area. But if we go outside it, we start to go wrong. As you know, if you stall the aircraft that go too fast, the wings fall off. And certainly it suggests that um, if we go into space, um, we know that astronauts, for instance, are extremely fit. They're, they're both athletes, but do they shift across to here? And does, for instance, space travel with no gravity result in you moving towards the metabolic syndrome type scenario where you start to accelerate the age of, especially over several years? Maybe a little bit of gravity might help. And so finally, um, this kind of raises quite an interesting point. Do we need to evolve? You know, we start with very fit astronauts, but they may not be. But we know within the population of humans, there are people, I and mean, everybody knows the story of um, you know, the, the grandmother who smoked 50 a day and weighed 15 stone and lived off fish and chips, but she survived to be 100. So are there, are there particular genetic profiles that enable us to survive in space? And as I think Mike uh, Levine will comment on, are life forms actually far more adaptable than we think? And there I'll finish. Thank you very much. Alistair, thank you very much in, in, indeed. Um, and um, uh, I often say about the granny that, as you say, over ate and, uh, and smoked and whatever, you can blindfold somebody and push them across a motorway or, uh, uh, and they'll get to the other side, but it may not be a very good habit, of course. Um, so uh, with that, we'll, let's turn to uh, Ashwin Behista, uh, Behisti, sorry, Ashwin. Um, who's bioinformatician and a principal investigator at KBR at NASA's Ames Research Center, and I think many of you will know Ashwin. And he has a background in physics, and he works on space biology projects related to microRNA and mitochondrial changes. And uh, we, would you please present your paper? Thank you. All right, yeah, thanks. I'm going to go really quickly, since I want to give enough time for everybody here. Um, so give you give you a little whirlwind about how mitochondrial space is, a mitochondria is impacted in space. So that's why data in a nutshell. So I'm always open for collaborations or talking more afterwards if, if you see anything appealing. So just, to, I, I apologize for people who've seen me talk before and see this slide, but um, see these upcoming slides, but just in case people are not familiar with space flight and experiments, um, I'll have to give a nice early background of um, what, what's going on, but um, some might say, how, how do we do experiments in space and what does it involve? I usually just give it a little, Synopsis of this, just so people will know. Um, why care about space? I think Alistair covered this pretty nicely. Of course, you know, um, we're planning to go back, set up a colony on the moon permanently, and then eventually Mars, and then, you know, beyond, maybe the Star Trek scenario. So the space environment, um, you know, as Alistair pointed out, there's different uh, 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 conditions or hazards that uh, evolve in space. So uh, two of the main ones I concentrate on, um, not saying those are the most important ones, but because uh, the basic environments in space, you know, as this paper we put out a couple of years ago, review, talks about like, for example, distance from space is one of the hazards, confinement, you know, hostile closed environment. But the two main components I, I look on is microgravity, um, which is the lack of, you know, the, the basis of the lack of gravity, which is different from what Alistair was saying in the gravitational fields and what people have discussed. And then also, um, the space radiation impact, which can be impacted by, you know, electromagnetic fields and so on. As we know, in, in, in low Earth orbit, which a lot of the experiments are done and, and all the data that's being gathered right now is, is protected by the magnetic sphere, which I'm sure we're going to hear plenty about uh, in the talks to come. But as we know for physics, that reduces the amount of dose that, you know, we'll get um, or that the astronauts will get at the International Space Station or, you know, the former sh shuttle missions that occurred. So the concern is now that we go to Moon and Mars, now we're going to get exposed to the full uh, spectrum of galactic cosmic rays that are out there. And that's going to be a lot more damaging. So this is kind of a little uh, diagram that shows us, say, if you get a CT scan on Earth or exposure to different gamma radiation on Earth, a low LET, which I'm going to go into in a second, compared to the doses we'll get if it'll say a six-month duration on the way to Mars, this is the dose we'll get. And I'll tell you in a second why um, the dose is comparable, like the space radiation is very different from the radiation we experience on the Earth. It's a lot more damaging. So as our um, mighty heroes, Fantastic Four, we realized back in the day, you know, galactic cosmic rays is, is, is an issue. But in reality, um, as I'll show you, you won't probably have superpowers. You might have to check into a hospital and, and won't be saving anyone. But so the difference, if you're not familiar with uh, uh, the, about space radiation and, and the 
radiation we experience on Earth is we, we consider this as, a, as low energy transfer or LET defining. So low LET is defined as like gamma or alpha particles, you know, or, or, or sorry, not alpha particles, but gamma or photon. So basically it's high speed particles like sand particles going through your cells and, and, and don't, don't deposit the energy as much in the cells. But high LET is basically the heavy ions, which can be in space from anywhere from um, you know, uh, protons, helium to iron particles, as large as that. And those are basically slower moving particles, but they deposit all the energy, transfer all the energy into the cells, causing a lot more damage. So let's say, you know, in radiotherapy, you might have cancer, you have two gray of gamma. That's not equivalent of two gray of, of cosmic radiation. It's more like if you say, if you get 10, 10 gray of gamma, that'd be two gray of cosmic radiation. But just to give you an idea, a trip to Mars and back is, a, is estimated to have a total dose of half a gray of galactic cosmic radiation, which would be a combination of these heavy ions. So that's a little background about space. And all this impact that would happen on, on us causes lots of health risks that we're aware of and probably many more that we're not. And, and you know, it could be sex dependent or sex independent, depending on, you know, what organ you look at and what area. So there's many different things related with, let's say, CNS issues, cardiovascular risks, um, and so on, which uh, people are starting trying to study. And, and I'll show you, I think all this stuff is related to mitochondrial impact that happens is maybe the central hub. But what type of experiments that happen? So, you know, you could actually send things to space. So these are mighty mouse knots. Some of them having a good time floating around without a hamster, without one of those wheels, they could just have a good time in space. Or if you, let's say you don't have the funding to send samples to space, um, you could do simulated experiments on Earth. So one, one place you could go is Brookhaven National Lab in Long Island, New York, where you could use the NASA Space Radiation Laboratory set up in the early 2000s. So actually, it uh, takes part of this high energy physics collider beam and simulate the heavy ions that are in space. So you can put things like mice or cells and stuff. And the other way to simulate microgravity, which is not truly accurate, but it's the best we have. So it's kind of silly. It's a high limb unloading. You spend the mice by the tail. And, you know, it kind of uh, simulates the unloading of the weight in the back leg. Now, as I said, it's not very accurate for true microgravity, but, you know, this is the best we can do because there's really no way on Earth you could truly simulate microgravity. But we try to find ways that could be comparable for some um, tissues and stuff. And there's other types of experiments people do on the ISIS, like they say in worms to look at different tissue functions, fish even, fruit flies, you know, Drosophila, they do plant experiments that are important to you know, understand that can you have sustainable food and plant growth in space, and then of course microbes and other types of experiments. So there's a couple of years ago, uh, me, Chris Mason, Susan Bailey organized with Cell Press a large amount of papers, and this is still there in the portal, I put these little QR codes if you're fancy with technology, you can scan them as I quickly figure the slides. But if you go here, there's a bunch of like about 30 papers. And one paper I'm going to discuss here is this mitochondrial paper that came out. And there's some newer data related to that, that you know, for more follow-up papers. But it gives you kind of an idea there. There's now, stay tuned in April, there's a whole new package coming with Nature. It's going to have a Nature portal talking about uh, kind of a updated, you know, uh, astronaut talking about, about commercial missions and more. So in April, stay tuned for the huge amount of papers coming out related to that. And then... Where does all this data, let's say if you don't have um, funding to work on this, there's a lot of free data out there right now that NASA has this gene lab resource where you go on there and it's all the omics, all the bioinformatic work that people have done from transcriptomics, proteomics, and so on is available here on gene lab. You can go to their data repository and just mine free data that's out there and uh, come up with your favorite hypothesis and answer that and, you know, based on the data about like, samples flown to space from mice to various other um, organisms. And if you're interested in joining a larger group of people, like I lead the multi-omics group, this is the analysis working groups that we have that scientists from all, all around the world that are part of, and some people here are probably part of that, and they can join and work on neat projects um, that I'll discuss. So let's just dive into the science mitochondria. This paper here came out, as I said, this is part of the analysis working group. There's a large collaborative um, project, a lot of people worked on it. And this give you a big, basic summary. I'm not gonna go into the details because it's a nutshell, Talk. So paper links here, you can read the paper. But in a nutshell, what we did is, is, is the, the experiment started or the work started, is there a master switch that in space that could be turned on or off in the body that, you know, it could be modulated, whether it's due to the magnetic fields or the space radiation or uh, microgravity. We didn't dissect that apart because these are the samples that were flown to space. And we went to that resource and that's the gene lab has. Find, found like you know the organ like mice that were flown to space from two different strains of mice and looked at all these different organs that were there. 
looked at all the different types of omics that are available from methylation to you know transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. And then we also looked at some cell lines that were flown. And indeed, once everyone started coming back, you know, saying everyone went off in their own uh, labs, started analyzing the data, came back, and the top hit everyone said was mitochondrial dysfunction that kept showing up over and over again. Whether you're looking at the eye, the liver, the kidney, you know, so on, every organ had that. The interesting part was, as we know, um, sometimes the mitochondrial dynamics are organ dependent. So, for example, when you see the muscle wasting happen in the paper, we show that uh, mitochondrial suppression happened due to like the sarcopenia or muscle wasting that happens um, in space. But the lever, the mitochondrial activity was overexpressed, which I'm going to go into in a second. But um, but one thing that was interesting also to show is we had um, actually human data from the NASA twin study to confirm this and also some physiological data. So uh, just to concentrate on one figure from the paper, looking at the human data, um, this is the NASA twin study. That also, we have some, you know, looking at some mouse data here um, describing it. But one interesting thing that I'm going to focus on just really briefly because it's going to be um, uh, uh, continued with the future work that I'm going to show you in a second, is that mitochondrial uh, DNA uh, complexes, as you see here, are this is uh, the Scott Kelly and Mark Kelly that influenced it. So Scott, uh, Mark Kelly was the twin on the ground that this experiments were. So we did a twin study. And then Scott Kelly was a twin who was flown to space for about a year. Um, and it, within the year the span he was there, we saw a lot of mitochondrial dysfunction happen in it because they you know, gathered blood and everything else. And we profiled a lot of different things, the investigators. The main PI was Chris Mason, who did with a bunch of other PIs that were involved. But what we see here is that you know, mitochondrial DNA in space is heavily upregulated, which is not good. And then once he comes back, luckily it starts resolving. We also had astronaut physiological data compiled from the past uh, you know, few decades. And this is like 60 astronauts compiled together and some physiological markers from the blood and urine showing you know, cellular oxidative stress indeed occurs when these astronauts are in space. So this is L is launch, so 45 days before launch and FD is the time during flight from 15 to 100 days and then R is return and then 30 days after return. And you can see that happens. And this here is like a mitochondrial profile of all the genes. And there are shifts basically happening in Scott Kelly's mitochondrial profile, meaning the global transcriptomic um, genes uh, related to mitochondria that shifts in the time he was in space. So that's kind of the take home message there. And interesting enough, this is from the mouse data when we did like some metabolic flux modeling based on transcriptomic data um, that we saw that impact I was uh, talking about the tissue dependent one. For example, this is muscle tissue here related with mitochondrial, uh, sorry, the green is liver tissue here, related with mitochondrial uh, dis, uh, related uh, flux, metabolic flux activity. And you can see in flight and ground that metabolic flux activity is pretty activated or highly regulated in the liver. While here's all the muscle tissue, we can see all the mitochondrial related metabolic flux uh, uh, activity or pathways are actually being suppressed due to the um, suppression. So this, I mean, I'm giving you really, big general overview, and I was concentrating more on the human data, because now we're working on further mitochondrial work. And one aspect is we're trying to get this paper out in the in next month, is now there's a bunch of other human data available. You know, human data and astronaut data is very limited, unfortunately, due to you know, experimental constraints you have and the number, low end number you have, but there's more and more coming out and they being made available to the public. So there's one from the JAXA, Japanese Space Agency, with uh, our collaborators uh, there, that and you can find this data on Gene Lab now if you go there. Um, but basically, what if in this paper, you know, now we're doing a really deep dive in mitochondrial analysis. And one thing again that pops up is that mitochondrial DNA ox phos complexes, which I outlined here, is this is during flight, pre flight, and this is um, after they come back. And this is compiled from six astronauts, averaged to get 120 days on the International Space Station. You can see again the mitochondrial DNA complexes are heavily upregulated when they're in space, and this is significant. And then what we start in this paper that hopefully you'll see in a couple of months published um, is that you know we see a lot of different mitochondrial complex activity when they're in space being dysregulated. It's kind of a, this down here is an overall pathway view of it of like complex one activity when they're in flight, complex five activity um, related to different you know energy and respiration activity is upregulated significantly when they're in flight. And then when they come back, you know, the post flight starts going back down. This is now some work we're doing with Chris Mason in his lab um, about the Inspiration 4. So Inspiration 4 is like the first commercial mission that was uh, done with SpaceX. It was four astronauts, three days in space. And the interesting thing about this mission is that um, there's, there's going to be a bunch of papers in April coming out, the Nature package that I mentioned. But um, the interesting thing about this 
is that they flew through 590 kilometers in elevation. So this ISS is, um, I think roughly around 300, I forget exactly where it is, but it's much lower. So the amount of um, the protection they might get from the Van Alba is, is actually reduced based on their elevation. And it's, and the, you know, when you measure the radiation dose they got, that was equivalent to about nine months on the ISS. So they, you know, three days in space, uh, they got a pretty high dose. And I guess the astronauts when they came back, they asked Chris, uh, the, so did we get cooked up there? Um, you know, and most of the most of the levels came back down to normal levels. But when you started diving into this mitochondrial uh, related activity, again, mitochondrial DNA complexes, this is done in single cell RNA seq. I'm um, looking at the specific cell types that were in the blood. You can see activity happening depending on the cell type. Again, it was elevated. Um, even after flight. So this is comparing immediately post-flight, meaning the day they came back, and then long-term post-flight, meaning 82 days or 45 days uh, grouped together. And this interesting thing. So this is this ongoing work, and you'll hopefully see this in the next couple of months coming out, um, that uh, indeed is that we did a lot more deeper dive into mitochondrial. NASA is looking at different metabolic um, activity, met uh, metabolism activity, and so on and so on, that is showing this huge mitochondrial dysfunction happening in humans. And there's other projects happening there. So one thing is, can you mitigate this response? And I'm gonna go really quickly through this because the short answer is yes, there's potential ways you could use countermeasures to do that and it's through microRNAs. Um, there's this paper initially we put out a couple of years ago again, looking at microRNAs and how, and I had identified a microRNA signature related to space flight. And then that signature, we started inhibiting key fat, key uh, components of it, and we saw the mitigation I'll show. And microRNAs, if you don't know what it is, it's really quickly, uh, microRNAs are basically involved with every aspect of our classically viewed molecular biology before you know 2000 was this, and then after 2000, microRNA world quickly erupted and people started looking at it. And a single microRNA can regulate hundreds to thousands of messenger RNA or genes, very small non-coding RNA, meaning RNA that doesn't translate to protein, and due to their stability, they can freely, but freely in quotes, I should put that in the body, meaning that um, they could be either, you know, flowing with a protein attached to them or in an exosome or lipids. Um, but they could get in and out of cells that way and do uh, be involved in diseases or good aspects of your body. And they're very highly conserved between species. So for me, I love dealing with them because it could be good biomarker and potential therapeutic angle countermeasure. And also, um, there's things called mitomeres, which is mito mitochondrial microRNAs. So there's microRNAs that can influence mitochondria or microRNAs that come from mitochondrial. And these three microRNAs that I've outlined here that are related to my space flight signature micro are actually considered mitomeres. So in a nutshell, can you be used as a therapy? And one of the papers, what we showed is with my collaborator, Pete, at Columbia University, uh, he has this 3D microvascular uh, tissue structure. And basically, it's just um, these endothelial cells put together, no blood flowing. This, uh, shell basically of a microvasculature. And the three microRNAs we took that was involved with my space flight signature, those, we went to Brookhaven National Lab, radiated these uh, uh, 3D structures with uh, this galactic cosmic ray simulated beam that they have there. This is uh, with no radiation, with radiation, the vessels start collapsing, this is the quantification of that. And these are the three microRNAs I'm looking at. These are some other microRNAs that were involved, that were upregulated during that process that are involved in my signature. So can, by applying this, uh, uh, inhibitor for these microRNAs called antagomeres through one of my collaborators as a company that creates these. It's basically a self-delivery. Um, you give them a sequence, they find the antagonist sequence to the microRNA and then designs a system that can get in and out of cells and, and find the target to inhibit, this, in this case, microRNAs. And so when we did this, in a nutshell, surprisingly, we indeed saw that, you know, after the uh, we gave 24 hours prior to the radiation and looked at it for six days. It completely rescued the response um, that happened with ra uh, radiation and space radiation effect. And then this is just the scrambled uh, control for the vehicle that you know didn't have any effect. So the vehicle is not the rescuer. The actually inhibition of microRNAs are. We had another paper looking at an, an, like an angiogenic model or developmental model. This did the same thing. And now this is a paper preprint that we submitted um, just recently. And this is the follow-up to this. So again. Uh, we did some follow-ups looking at single combination and that and how this might impact let's say dna repair structures and we see that it did potentially improve the efficiency of it again going through it really quick here one interesting thing is when we now did a global transcriptomic profile and analyzed everything we see that um here green is the half a gray without um uh the treatment and the blue is your control meaning nothing is just no radiation or treatment and the, the yellow is now the radiator with the antagonist treatment you see globally it's pro of pushing the gene profile or the transcriptomic profile closer to whether it's the angiogenic model or the mature model, pushing it closer to the zero gray level, which is pretty interesting to see. 
And some of the things that were rescued indeed was in, like all that this, this here is the comparison, zero grade, of, uh, the radiation was zero grade or with the treatment, and this is comparing the treatment uh, with the radiation doses. What was interesting is that we completely rescued like innate immune responses and other inflammatory responses. So I'm not showing here, you could look at the preprint, well, it's under review to read it. And then what's interesting, when you look at the targets of these microRNAs and do the kind of the same analysis, and then see what there was 21 genes that were really just uh, uh, within the targets that were uh, not significant anymore with the treatment, meaning that it was rescued. When you focus on those ones, they see mitochondrial being a key factor. And what's interesting now, when you do a really deep dive in mitochondrial analysis, I'm throwing a lot at you, but I'm going quickly through it, so then you can talk to me later, is that indeed, like this metal column is what you see a lot of uh, mitochondrial rescue or behavior happening that are pushing mitochondrial back to maybe either suppressing it or getting closer to the levels it should be behaving in these cell line structures. Some follow-up experiments, um, we have another paper under review that has this data in it um, that we looked at different, uh, we did an animal experiment with these, uh, uh, again, simulated that Brookhaven experiment with space radiation impact. And we did the antagomeres and we just did an IP injection into the animals. And what's interesting is like TGF beta was rescued. This is looking at the heart specifically on the mice. So this is here, this is, um, uh, nor this is the mice irradiated. This is the mice that were uh, given the antagomer treatment. This is just the sham, non-irradiated with and without treatment. So TGF beta was rescued, and then um, things like MCU, which is a mitochondrial marker, is brought back down to normal when it's up. It's bad in the heart from and it's caused with mitochondrial calcium transfer. And then MC MICU one again is a mitochondrial lid with MCU, like mitochondrial transfer, trans uh, tr calcium transfer, and with the treatment it brings it back up to the level. So in a nutshell, which is what the title was, um, you know, mitochondrial is definitely, the, uh, I think, it, 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 well, I should say definitely, some people might not think it's the key, but I think it is the key, this regulated factor in space and the body, and a lot of things happen downstream, as if you, when you look at the papers more and more that I've been putting out on others, you see that mitochondrial is the central regulator, and like those immune function that might happen, this function that might happen, is uh, below what the mitochondrial dysfunction is. And you saw with the, like, the antagomere rescue treatments that I've done or the microRNA rescue treatments I've done, it, it rescued the immune response once I blocked the microRNAs that were related to mitochondrial functions. So, and, and you know, potentially the one avenue that you might be able to mitigate the response of the damage caused to mitochondria is maybe the microRNAs. There's, other, of course, you know, there's many avenues people can look at for therapeutics, for example, uh, all this nice mitochondrial type uh, therapeutics that people are exploring in the clinic these days that's a whole uncharted uh, area to tap for people to tap to potentially have a nice uh, countermeasure to maybe mitigate the damage to mitochondria. As we know, the microRNA, uh, if I redevelop this, it hasn't been approved by the FDA or anything like that. So it has, it has a while to go to reach um, for me to stick it in a human, but there are some mitochondrial treatments out there that people could actually take advantage of now that potentially could be a mitigation strategy for this. And of course, the mitochondria works this and the microRNA acknowledgements that. So went through it really quick. Hopefully I wasn't too much over. Ashton, thank you very much indeed. Uh, well well done because you're, we're literally only two minutes uh, behind schedule. So well done. That's fantastic. Um, uh, and uh, we'll invite questions for both of those, those papers. Um, whilst people are thinking about their questions, don't forget to use your electronic uh, hands if you like to ask some questions of, um, of Alistair and Ashton.